our world is a strange place. And when I say world, I mean world. I don't mean a specific city, country, continent, I mean our planet. And that's a good thing. If you wanna see something weird or strange, sometimes it's a matter of just walking down the street. But if you don't know where these weird things are, that's okay, because Atlas Obscura does. Atlas Obscura is a website dedicated to cataloging anything strange in the world, from weird statues, to haunted forests, to sculptures long forgotten to history, to 24,000 oddities that are documented on their website. But keep in mind, the word strange doesn't always mean scary, these are just obscure. And like I said, these 24,000 oddities are scattered throughout the globe. And I am sure there's one near you, whether you live in a sprawling cityscape or an empty, barren desert. Today, I'm going to discuss five entries on Atlas Obscura, five things I found interesting, and I hope you will too. Our first entry is the perfect example of something being obscure. Not scary, just kinda weird. To fully tell the story, you need to imagine something. Imagine you're a hunter. It's 1775, and you're deep in the woods of Nigeria, and you stumble upon a grove, and you soon realize you're not alone. Not only are you not alone, you're being watched by thousands of eyes. You get closer, and you see thousands of these small stone figurines left behind, arranged in a circle. Some are men, some are women, some are short, some are tall, some have weapons, some have farming tools. They all vary in size, shape, profession, age, and gender. Now us seeing these now, we know they're simply stone figurines. But like I said, imagine stumbling upon this thing 300 years ago. The legend of the Ezzy figurines spread, and it caused locals to believe they were once humans, now turned to stone. Now it's not exactly known how these things ended up here, but it's probably not as exciting as that. It's estimated these things were carved between 1100 to 1500, and may have been made by the Yoruba people, who lived close to this location. Further excavations on the area uncovered more and more of these figurines, and they can be viewed at multiple spots, including the Nigerian National Museum in Lagos and the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. I have spent my entire life in West Virginia. I've lived in a handful of houses, and I of course would visit my friends and family's homes. And the one thing that connected all of them was the woods. I love spending time in the West Virginia woods, as long as it was daylight. There's not a lot out there. We might find a knocked over tree or a femur of a cow or something, but nothing as exciting as a crashed World War II plane, which is located in the Valentine Plains of Australia, which is awesome. I would have loved to have a crashed plane in my backyard, and it definitely would have been my hangout spot of choice. But how did this plane get here? Well, no one knows for sure. Well, we know it crashed, but we don't know why. This plane is the beautiful Betsy, and it was considered missing for nearly 50 years. On February 26, 1945, the plane was dispatched on a flight between Darwin to Brisbane, Australia. The aircraft was previously damaged in a firefight and was now regulated to short transportation flights and was said to be retired at the earliest convenience. The Australian Royal Air Force soon realized they should have retired it sooner, as the beautiful Betsy never made it to its destination. The plane went missing and remained so for 50 years. It wasn't until August of 1994 when a park ranger named Mark Rowe was checking the results of a controlled burn in the Kroombit Tops National Park. He noticed lights reflecting off of something, about 800 meters away. He investigated, and he found the beautiful Betsy, left here to rust for 50 years. The discovery was originally kept a secret, so that the United States could investigate the site, in an attempt to find any artifacts or human remains. The site was investigated, and some personal items were found including a class ring, a handful of bracelets, some dress uniforms, and seven dog tags. Human bone fragments were also scattered throughout the site, causing officials to believe all of the crewmen died on impact. The beautiful Betsy is open to the public to visit, 
And there's a plaque memorizing the eight soldiers who lost their lives in this tragedy. Los Angeles is one of the most populated cities in America, but even in this town that 3.8 million people call home also houses several mysterious places, including an abandoned, derelict, graffiti-covered World War II-era compound. Rustic Canyon's Murphy Ranch was first built in the 1930s by a couple named Winonia and Norman Stevens, who allegedly had ties to a group that was sympathetic to the National Socialists of Germany. The area was then purchased by someone named Jesse Murphy, someone who is not mentioned anywhere else and would never arrive in person to the property, leading conspiracy theorists to believe this was just a pseudonym, a fake name. Now this is the part that gets kinda tinfoil hat-like. Allegedly, a German national named Herr Schmidt approached the couple, claiming that Germany would soon prevail through World War II and would defeat the United States, and urged them to build a self-reliant compound to house the German elites after the invasion. The couple, Hearing the ravings of a madman they didn't know, naturally believed him, and built a self-reliant compound. Massive tanks of fuel and water, a bomb shelter, and many other underground bunkers were added, allowing for an extended stay if necessary. Further blueprints revealed plans for a four-story mansion with a basement, multiple libraries, and social rooms to be built. But these plans never went through. Now this place is already surrounded by myth and urban legend, so let's add on another one. Locals claim that this place was raided after Pearl Harbor, and a 50-strong caretaker force was arrested, but there is absolutely no evidence of this happening, it is only an urban legend. The ranch has remained abandoned since the war, and nature, along with local artists, have reclaimed the area. What remains of the Murphy Ranch is covered in graffiti, and what is left is an appropriate question, because the place is slowly falling apart. In 2016, the city of Los Angeles demolished parts of the ranch, but there are some still standing. So if this is a place you want to see, make it sooner rather than later. The Pacific Ocean, the world's largest expanse of water, bigger than all of the world's land combined. Its seemingly infinite expanse of the water doesn't have much going on in it. In fact, there's one spot of land of the Pacific Ocean called Point Nemo, and if you were to be here, the next closest human to you would be on the International Space System. These such vast expanses of emptiness are dotted with islands which are all home to their own interesting cultures, but no matter how small or seemingly insignificant these islands may be, they are all brimming with history. And one such island in this umbrella is Clipperton Island. Calling Clipperton an island is a bit of a stretch, as it's just under three and a half square miles. Clipperton Island was first discovered on January 24th, 1521 by Spanish explorer Ferdinand Magellan, but the island was first charted up nearly 200 years ago by French merchant Michael Dubocage. He drew up a map of the island and claimed it for his country. This island's notorious history then begins in 1821, when Mexico declared independence and took possession of land that had once belonged to Spain. And since they technically discovered Clipperton Island first, Mexico claimed it. The island was named La Pasión, and Mexico set up a guano mining operation here. Since the island was basically a strip of sand, there was next to no natural resources here, so the miners and other workers depended upon the Mexican government to keep them supplied. And they did up until 1905, when the Mexican Revolution began. Over the next few years, the worker populace of La Pachon began to succumb to malnutrition and dehydration. This left one surviving male, Victoriano Alvarez. He declared himself king of the island, and took to enslaving or straight up murdering the remaining women and children. His reign lasted for a short period of time, before one of the island's widows took revenge, 
killing Victoriano. Eventually, a passing ship rescued 11 survivors, leaving Clipperton Island abandoned. Over the next 30 years, the back and forth claims between Mexico and France continued, and the land was eventually given to France, and then the island was just forgotten about. During World War II, Clipperton Island was used by the U.S. Navy to establish a weather station to help monitor activity across the Pacific region. And a few years before this, President FDR himself visited Clipperton Island as a part of a fishing trip. Since the end of the war, Clipperton Island has been used for simple scientific observations on the weather, climate, and wildlife. This island just proves that no matter how obscure, distant, or seemingly meaningless it may be, when you're standing on land, you're standing on history. Every nation on planet Earth has a dark history they try and keep hidden, and Belgium is no different. Belgium's dark history can be summarized with one name, Leopold II, who served as the nation's king from 1865 to 1909. What he did in this 44-year-long period firmly cemented him in the list of history's worst names. In these 44 years, King Leopold was the complete and total owner and overseer of the Congo Free State, which is now the modern-day Republic of the Congo. In these 44 years, the atrocities committed against the Congo were so extensive and severe, they warrant an entire Wikipedia page solely dedicated to them. Even before Leopold took the throne, he began to push for the establishment of a Belgian colony in Africa. But the Belgian government did not want a colony, so Leopold had to rethink his strategy. He established the International African Association, which he claimed was made to provide humanitarian assistance to the continent in an attempt to improve the lives of the area's native populace. The European leaders accepted this claim, and he officially gained control of the Congo Free State, an area of about 2.3 million square kilometers, which is bigger than the states of Alaska and Texas combined. Leopold had ulterior methods that were the exact opposite of philanthropic. He wanted to exploit the area for their natural resources, which included ivory and their mango rubber. Rubber was quickly rising in demand, thanks to its use in the tires of bicycles and cars, its use in industrial belts, and its use for coating wires. But rubber was tricky to get. Rubber trees were slow to mature, so natural sources of it were sought out. One such area full of rubber was the Central African Rainforest, which Leopold now owned a massive part of. The rubber of the Congo was inside these vines, and they had to be slashed, causing it to spew out all over the person harvesting it. From here, they had to rub it off their body into a bucket, a truly grueling process. The people of the Congo were given extremely high quotas, and failure to meet them resulted in death. Leopold established a private army, the Force Publique, and anytime they killed someone, they were told to cut off the hands of their victim, as their ammunition was closely monitored. Disease ran rampant all over the Congo Free State, adding another factor into the total death toll which reached somewhere near 10 million. While all of this was taking place in the Congo, over in Belgium, the king was living a lavish life. Leopold began to construct a private train stop, which would then be used to link his family's private summer residence. The Halte Royal d'Ardennes, or the Royal Train Start of the Ardennes, was finished in 1891, six years after the Congo Free State was established. Within a few years, the residence was repurposed into a hotel, which had all of the luxuries of the late 1800s, including running water, electricity, and even a telephone. During World War I, the hotel and train station were both damaged, causing them to be closed. They were reopened, but closed once again as World War II began. In 1968, the Royal Hotel was burned down, and this train station was left without a purpose, causing it to be abandoned, which then allowed nature to take it back over leaving it looking like this. It is open to the public to visit, but requires a bit of a hike to reach. Despite the train station's descent into obscurity, the atrocities perpetrated by its owner must remain in our memory forever. And here we are. I hope I was able to provide a good first look into Atlas Obscure for you. It's a great website and you should definitely check it out. 
see what's out there, and see what's bright in your neighborhood. If you want to see more of Atlas Obscura, be sure to let me know. And if you find anything interesting on there, tell me about it in my comments or in my Discord server, which is linked in my bio. That's all from me. Have a great day, everyone.